Um, so the, the problem I, I hope to postulate to you all is that um, generic recommendations are, are reasonably low efficacy. Um, I mean, it's, it's not always so, but I mean, but they're typically not, not great. And, and kind of in, in the way that I, I feel like a lot of systems recommend things to me, it's, it's literally just like throwing things out there, like, hey, people might like this. And so the proposed solution, on the other hand, is, is to leverage um, what we know about users, what we know about um, how groups may be connected, and, and by leveraging the relationships to, to really provide something interesting to the users. Um, and so, and when I say it's, it's all about relationships, I actually mean it's all about data relationships, meaning how are things connected. So uh, Neo4j is a graph database that leverages something we call a, a property graph model. And what that simply means is we use edges and vertices, um, or in our, our nomenclature, no, uh, nodes and relationships. Um, nodes will just simply be objects in your graph um, that have a, a unique identity. Um, they can be labeled to, to create subgraphs or describe groups. And they can be enriched with you know, zero to n key value pairs. And you can store any of the Java primitives as, as these key value pairs. Um, relationships, um, to think of it in a, um, in the way we speak, could, could be the verbs between the, these entities. Um, and those can also be enriched with, with uh, key value pairs or properties. Um, you can kind of think of these as the adverbs to how things are, are, act, are, are functioning. Um, so for example, up here we can see um, the story of Annie and Dan. Um, and you can see these are directed relationships. And this is important when considering things like, well, Dan loves Annie. Annie only, only likes Dan. Um, and maybe we can look at the story where, you know, Dan is living with Annie. Um, he's, he's borrowing Annie's car. And, and so we can really kind of inspect a little bit about the, the story behind our data in hopefully a very clear and, and apparent way. And so something I want to highlight is, is this is actually how Neo4j stores the information on disk. Um, we have a node store and an edge store. And the reason why this is, this is profoundly powerful is um, it allows operations to be done rather than through index lookups, but through uh, pointer arithmetic. And um, that allows you to, when operating on really, really large data sets, you see a flat response time for, for given types of queries. Um, and to introduce our data set, um, so how many, you guys all know what a meetup is, yeah, right? We're, we're geeky developers, yes? Anyone not know? Oh, okay, so uh, a meetup is, is a, a website that essentially facilitates the attendance of, of get-togethers. And the entire motivation for their, um, their platform is to encourage people to get together and, and learn and do of interesting things. And um, as a ramification, the way they, they make money is by getting people to attend these groups. And so these recommendations are very important for, for the uh, you know, profitability of, of, their, of their platform. And so uh, meetups.com's recommendations take uh, a few different forms. Um, it's kind of the, the typical people who, who went to this meetup or are interested in this meetup um, are also in. Um, just simply just suggestions of saying, hey, Kev, um, you're part of you know, San Francisco Big Data Science. You may want to go to um, you know, Tech Connector's Big Data Conference. Um, as well as sending you emails and saying, hey, by the way, these are some events that are coming up that, that kind of fit into your profile. Um, what are you doing this afternoon? And then also moving through their calendar at, you know, when I, I see what's going on this evening, they'll say, oh, at 6.30 there are five different events. Um, how do we rank and sort those things to say, um, Kevin's probably more, more interested in one thing versus another. And so um, there, there's several different recommendation queries we're gonna try and walk through today. Um, we're gonna look at groups to join, topics to follow, and events to attend. And um, we're gonna take this from the perspective of a meetup.com user. Um, though you could look at this from the other side if you wanted to do backwards work the, the system to see how do I actually, as a business or, or a group, get myself to the top of these results. Um, and of course, you know, this is not likely your underlying data set, but the hope is to, to introduce some concepts that um, provide you with, with a good foundation for applying this to whatever it is you, you're actually working on. And so the, the data we grabbed is from the, the Meetup API. Um, it's actually a very, very, very rich API, and we can grab uh, quite a few different things out of it. And so hopefully to make this hyper-local, we, we, we crawled the, the, the Chicago meetup groups, um, grabbed some of the big data events, some of the, the outdoorsy things, um, some of the social networking events, and 
hopefully this, will, this makes things very interesting. Um, so if we're just kind of inspecting a, a, a normal meetup page, um, these are the different pieces of information we, we may want to grab onto to look at. Um, and so we're going to have you know, groups, the members of those groups, um, the events these groups are hosting, um, the topics that these groups are talking about, um, the where they are is, is incredibly important, and then also you know, time. I mean, I, maybe I can't go to a 10.30 a.m. event, but really you know, at 4 o'clock I'm ready to get out of the office. Um, and so if we were to look at things like, oh, and, you know, as a member of the Outdoorsy Entrepreneurship Meetup, um, I want to find similar meetup groups so that I can join them. And so um, to look at kind of what may make these groups similar, um, we often will look at the, the things that, they, that they'd like to talk about, the topics that they, they discuss. And we can use you know, shared topics as, as a proxy for similarity. Um, this is basic you know, content filtering where we're going to say, well, Neo4j is all about being open source, and um, Data Science London is also all about being open source. Maybe those groups are fairly similar, and people who are interested in one may be interested in another. And so um, I show this slide again, because now we're, we're actually going to start um, getting into the browser and actually you know, writing a little bit of code. Um, is, so is everyone download Neo4j that wants to? Yeah, good. Um, and so, uh, great grasp, Batman. Let's go to the browser. Um, so to start Neo4j, um, simply navigate into um, wherever you, you've downloaded or stored it, um, and then it's you know, dot slash bin Neo4j space start. Um, Neo4j hopefully will be ready by the time I, I click over to the next window. Um, and so this is the uh, Neo4j browser. Um, it's a query workbench for you to um, test and look at, okay, are the queries I'm entering actually interacting with the data in which I hope? Um, though, of course, there's, there's um, a, a shell output for, for more traditional interaction methods. And so um, the guide that, that we're going to be walking through today, and is that readable? Mostly? Yeah. Um, so just colon play http colon slash slash guides dot neo4j dot com forward slash pi data chi. Um, and you can leave off the, the file portion. Um, that's for me in case there was bad internet, um, in case, uh, so I, I stored the files locally. But so this would be the, the correct um, guide for you guys. Cool, Every, everybody there? Oh, and so a quick, you know, 30 second tour of, of how to interact with the browser. Got the browser. Um, up here we have our wonderful uh, query entry point. Um, to uh, add additional lines, Shift Enter allows you to, to scroll up and down. Um, once you've done Shift Enter, Command Enter will execute the query, or you can guys click up here on this wonderfully designed Start button. Um, if you need to cycle through previous queries, um, command up will allow you to, to cycle through everything that you've been, 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 been typing in. And if, that, if you're going trying to go you know, way, 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 way back, um, colon history um, would be a, a manner to, to pull up all the, all the queries that you've executed. Um, over here on the left, we have a little bit of information about um, our database. Um, we're starting fresh together. So I have no node labels in our database, no relationship types, no property keys. Um, over here, I have some safe scripts because you know, live coding is terrifying. Um, and also some, some quick links to, to documentation. So let's, let's, let's get started. Um, so let's go ahead and start by clicking on the, the recommended groups by topic. And so, so this is the, the data model that we're going to be working against for at least this initial portion. Um, we're simply going to be looking at um, Groups will have a relationship to a topic, and uh, by the way, we're gonna the the words inside the bubbles will be considered our labels in this case. Um, and, you know, if a group shares a topic with another group, are they similar? And you know, we will rank their similarity by the more shared topics that they have. Um, and so the, the the way in which we're gonna get data into Neo4j is we're gonna use something called the the load CSV tool. Um, it's a, a transactional ETL tool that will allow Neo4j to grab a, a flat file, interpret it and transform it, hopefully into a, a reasonable graph model that we can work against. Um, so uh, go ahead and click this first prompt. 
Um, so you click the gray box, it'll it'll um, render it up here in the in the um, query bar. And so we can actually kind of look at what is, what is the the type of um, data that we're pulling in. And so uh, to break down this this query a little bit, we're saying we're calling the the load CSV tool. We're saying we have a CSV with headers, meaning you know, at the top of the column is is some sort of um, title for, for what that information is um, from, and then we provide it with a, a location. Um, these can be um, either local files or, or a URL. Um, I'm using local files just for expediency. Um, you guys will see uh, URLs pointing to um, uh, a CSV hosted on the internet. <laughs> um, we're aliasing it as a row, such as a, a for each, where like, oh, for each row, do X, Y, and Z. Um, and now we're just saying, oh, just return me the, those rows. We want to take a quick look. And only show me 10. I don't want to look at the entirety of, the, of that CSV. And so you, you may see something like this, where we have maybe the, the first entry in our CSV is a, um, a meetup group called the Evanston Sherman, make that a little bigger, the Evanston Sherman Avenue 900 block neighbors. Um, the organizer's name is, is Martin Renke. Um, and we have a bit more of information about it. The one thing to take a quick look at is we have an ID value here that we're going to be using to, to grab onto. Um, and so by the way, to, to, if you end up filling up your, your browser with too much stuff, um, just clicking on these X's clears them out for you. Um, if you get real frustrated, colon clear, we'll get rid of everything. Um, so we click along a little further. Let's actually import some data. Um, so we're going to say load CSV with headers from this location, um, alias the, that as row. Um, we're going to do merge, which means ensure this thing exists. Um, so it's a match or create. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, ensure that this group exists. So this, this colon group is, is the label we're working with. Um, and make sure that um, the gr a group exists of this ID. And then we're just grabbing this um, row ID value. And so we're going to say on create set um, all of these good things. Um, and we'd also append this and say, you know, um, on match set some other property if we, you know, so choose on match set, um, you know, group dot saw. Um, quick question. So sure. I, uh, I actually can't get the file because in there it, it also gives me local address, not the URL uh, in the tutorial. Uh, may, may I take it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I can't Um, the, the slash file is if you had them stored in a local directory. Um, so the question was, um, I'm having a little trouble getting to the, the correct data set. Um, so if you're seeing this file colon slash 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 location, um, you entered in the wrong browser guide. Um, that, that's my fault. Um, I, I, I cheated. And I was afraid of the internet. So I stored the files locally on my laptop. And so I gave these, these local locations. Um, if you guys don't, um, or, or if you guys want to code along, I would use this guide, but without the, um, the forward slash files. Um, so this would be the correct address to hit um, to, to, to actually access this guide. Um, is anyone else having similar troubles? Are we, are we all good? Awesome. So I should have been a little more clear. Yeah. Give a quick second. Cool. Um, so it's actually in, let's import a little bit of data. And so while that's running, we can talk about the next thing. Um, and so we're going to go through, and so for example, I've, I've ended up creating, you know, over a thousand labels, a thousand nodes. We set 5,000 properties. And we're actually just going to keep going through this. And so we're actually going to look at the, the groups underscore topic CSV now. And so um, what we're wanting to do now is look at um, what are they, we have, you know, if you remember our data model, we have the, the different groups we created. Now we're creating that center node, those, those different types of topics. Um, and so for example, um, we have a, a, um, a group is tied to a topic um, called neighbors. And so we'll go ahead and create that. And so what we can do is we actually inspect that and say, okay, did, did the, these things that I'm trying to import um, actually do what I wanted them to? Or did I actually get that, that data incorrectly? Oh. Ah, it's still loading. Um, if you guys are pulling these over the internet, they're moderately sized files, so it may take a little bit of time. Um, let's now let's take another look. 
So we actually were able to get them. So we have um, topics with a topic ID and, and a topic name. Um, if we wanted to return like a, a, a pretty picture of what these topics look like, we get a little bit more of a, a visual representation and ask to return instead of a, a given property on the node, you know, t.name, we're instead saying, well, actually, need for j return me the complete node, and we had some cool pictures. And you'll notice, though, um, we don't have any relationships branching off of them, right? These are just, you know, little islands in our, in our data store. And so the, the next step is going to be um, actually connecting the, the groups and topics. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to actually end up grabbing the, the group ID row um, within a CSV and then using that as a handle to say, okay, this group is, is tied to this tag. Um, so beforehand, though, um, we're, we're going to create some indexes. And I'm actually going to give you guys a quick note on, on how indexes work in Neo4j. They, they slightly vary from, from the relational world. Um, and though if we wanted to, to see what, what indexes were, were active now, we'd say, oh, we've created an index on um, nodes that are labeled group on the ID property and on topics that are labeled, or on nodes that are labeled topic. Um, they also have a, an ID property that has been indexed. Um, so a, come on. So a quick note on, on, on constraints inside Neo4j. There are, there are two types or two and a half types of constraints inside Neo4j. Um, one is a uniqueness constraint, um, which essentially just ensures uniqueness. Um, upon creating a uniqueness constraint, we auto-index that property. Um, and these are always going to be paired against a label and a given property on a node. Um, so the, the basic syntax for that is create constraint on some identifier t. This could be any variable. We're just, it's self-referential within the query. And um, grab the, the topic labeled nodes and then assert that t.id is unique. So assert that um, some property on, to on, on the topic nodes called id is unique. Um, if we're not as concerned about uniqueness, but simply just want a, a handle to allow us for fast lookups, um, we can just create a, a generic index, um, again, on the, these label property pairs. So it would simply be create index on um, colon group. This represents the label we're working with. And then the property is, is name. And also, so there are a couple of, of functions within Neo4j or keywords that are also index backed. backed. Um, exact equalities will be um, starts with contains and ends with. These are just string operators to, you know, to find if a, you know, a, a given property starts with a, a string or contains a string, et cetera. Um, range searches will also be indexed back, backed. And then um, existence slash non-existence checks as well. Um, so typically, at least for me, when I, when I first started working with Neo, my, my first was I will index everything. Which, it, coming from the original, that totally makes sense. If you're essentially grabbing, you know, doing a scan, grabbing things, say, oh, okay, it matches up here. Doing a scan, grabbing things, oh, it matches up there. And, you know, my result set is simply just the, the aggregate of all those things that all matched on, on joins. Um, those indexes are very, very, very helpful. Though they cost a lot of space storage, it makes things go quick, which is important. Um, on the other hand, Neo4j is not concerned with indexing to the same extent. Instead, we're simply indexing the our the, the property that we want to find for the starting points in our traversal. So uh, if we were to think of you know, identifying um, user groups, we may want to, to create a, a property on, or uh, an index on a given property that we're going to be searching on. But if we have like intermediate traversals, um, we don't really care about the properties on there because those won't be accessed until they're called at the very end of the query. And hopefully at that point, we filter down from you know, the ocean of our data set in like, you know, fairly reasonable size bucket. Um, so back to, back to the browser. Um, by the way, any questions so far? Yes, no, maybe so, cool. Um, so let's actually connect these groups. And so the reason why we wanted to index those properties was because we're actually doing some matches here to say, well, you know, grab these topics within our CSV rows and you know, match them with the actual topics that exist in our database now. Go ahead and grab these groups and you know, identify the ones that match up with that, that row in our CSV and find the, the groups that actually exist in our database. And then say, okay, now that we've found that they're, um, they match, go ahead and tie them together. Oh. 
And so we'll, you know, let's check. Let's make sure. Do we make some graphy things? And the answer is yes. We have pictures now. This, this is what Neo4j is all about, making pretty pictures. Um, and as a, as a side tangent, you can totally make your pictures more or less pretty depending on your preferences. You make the notes bigger, you make the notes smaller, you change the way we, we display them. Um, this is not paramount to your success as any for j developer, um, but I mean, have a little fun with it. Um, and so we see, for example, um, the Evanston Sherman group that we were talking about earlier um, has you know several topics branching off of it. Um, where you know it's a part of the neighbors topic, or it possesses a topic of neighbors, neighborhood, fun times, local issues, um, new to area, et cetera. Um, and we're going to essentially find out, okay, well, what what are the shared topics between you know, the Evanston Sherman Neighborhood Watch Group and you know anything else? And so again, more indexes, right? Because we're going to be searching on these things. Where we're actually, gonna be, I'm going to be looking up groups by their name. I'm going to be looking up topics by their name, and then I'll be using those as the starting points for these recommendation traversals. And so um, this command may not work for you guys. You have to install. Um, it's called APOC. It's a uh, awesome procedures on Cipher is the acronym. And if you guys are Matrix fans, you also know that APOC was a kind of the hacky character within within the Matrix, and it's exactly what we've done here. Um, Neo4j has a, a concept of stored procedures, um, and I'll earnestly say this is truly like my favorite feature in the past two years out of Neo4j. And what it does is it allows you to write, you know, in any JVM, JVM language, typically Java, um, a stored procedure that you can then you know drop into Neo4j as a plugin, and then call from the same endpoint um, that you hit Cipher with, and do some really, really interesting and complex traversals um, while still having the um, ease of use and the declarativeness of Cypher for the intermediate steps. Um, and so what we're going to do here is we're going to call, um, actually this is not even an APOC, right? I'm, I'm, all, I'm all off on, on a tangent. But so we're actually calling just the, the indexes here um, to look at um, what indexes are live and, and what, are they, what are they on. And so for example, we have indexes on group, group ID, um, group name, topic ID, and topic name. And they're all in line, right? We've, we've done what we, we've hoped to do. And so um, now I invite you all to explore the graph with me. Um, for those of you who know a little bit of Cypher, um, maybe let's try and find out what is the most popular topic. What topic has the most groups associated with it? Um, it's been like 15 seconds. Um, though if you guys are vastly impatient, you can just click next and see the answers. Um, the other questions we're going to be asking is which group was created most recently? We have a timestamp on, on these groups. And then um, how many groups have been running for greater than four years? Um, we're using um, milliseconds since Epoch, um, so it's easier to operate on. Um, so skipping ahead, um, this is the way we would figure out what the most popular groups are. We're matching a very, very generic relationship pattern here of saying, match me you know, a topic where it has a relationship called has topic, and then any node hanging off there. We're not being specific. And then we're simply going to, to count as uh, count the number of, of, of instances there. And um, for the relational developers, you may be looking at, well, you've counted, where's the group by? Um, there's an implicit group by on, on, this, on this pattern that we're matching. Um, and so let's order by the count descending, and, and this would be the result set. So it appears that social is the most popular, and I see a couple of people squinting. Um, so it appears that social is the most popular topic, social networking is next. It seems like if you're new and lonely, you're, you're on Meetup, and I don't know what that says about me as a person. Um, also, if you're an entrepreneur, you are both you know, uh, very, very deeply interested in, in Meetup groups. Um, so we move on to the next question, you know, which group was created most recently? Um, we're simply just ordering by the, this created timestamp. And so it turns out, if I want a little more, more row-y format, um, it was created at that timestamp, um, and it is the Ignite Executive Marketing Workshop. Um, this data is about a week old, so there's probably been new meetups since then, but um, as of a week ago. And the last one is, is you know, how many groups have been running for the past four years? Um, so you know, we're assuming no, no leap years. We're, you know, I'm not super accurate. Um, so over four years, 365 days, 24 hours a day, um, 60 minutes an hour, 
um, 60 seconds in, in a minute, and then uh, 1,000 milliseconds in a second. Um, and then we're just aliasing that as four years. And then we're going to match groups that were created at a time that is um, greater than um, four years ago. And so um, the Women Entrepreneurs Secrets of Success has been running in Chicago for greater than four years. Um, Asian American Chicago Network, Windy City Skaters, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, so this, this code is actually stolen from, from Mark Needham, who's part of the Neo4j London users group. Um, obviously, you know, if we were to search for groups or some of the, the London users group, I assume is not in Chicago, we're actually going to get no results. Um, but last night, I cheated and chose um, a group that I thought was really interesting, um, which is the Outdoorsy Entrepreneurs uh, Networking and Support Group. Um, and so uh, to kind of talk about this, this query we're trying to execute is we're saying match, meaning Neo4j, find me this pattern in my data. And we're saying find me a group that's called you know, the Outdoorsy Entrepreneurs Networking and Support Group that has a relationship to any given topic. And if you notice, um, <clears throat> topic here is simply an identifier. We didn't choose to say, oh, it's, it's you know, we didn't say um, be very specific, only, you know, groups that are related to an actual topic node. We're making the assumption that um, things that have a relationship called has topic are indeed topics. And so we just gave it a you know, generic identifier. We could, you know, we call it T, we call it middle thing. Um, these are all um, independent of, or these can be anything you want. They're simply just a handle to refer to um, within the query. And I, so for example, we're here, we're saying, okay, match me. And then grab all the other groups that are also attached to that topic node that the Outdoorsy Entrepreneurs Network is also tied to. And we're saying simply, return me the other group's name. Um, show me the, the count of shared topics between them. Meaning, so we have our Outdoorsy Entrepreneurs. We have these other groups. And simply just count up the number of in-between topics they share. And um, simply order them by that. So if they share more topics, hopefully I'm more interested in them and to go ahead and return me those things. And so um, apparently, if, if I'm into this group, uh, groups that are very similar to it would be, you know, a thousand places to see before, I, before you die, Chicago backpackers, great outdoors and survival. Um, apparently, it seems that entrepreneurship is less of a part of this than the outdoorsy adventureness. Um, but, you yeah, know, that, that is what it is. That's uh, how the, the group is self-described. Um, and so the next step is actually going to be doing something a little more sophisticated. And this is where, where Python makes Neo4j much more interesting. Um, we're going to do a community detection algorithm to actually see um, what groups kind of fall into interesting clicks or, 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 or groups. Um, so if you guys click on the, the next um, portion of the guide, um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to um, not only find similarity between based on topics, but actually trying to, to find um, natural groups that form into, into to a, a reasonable chunk. And so um, we're going to use a Jupyter notebook, um, use a little bit of iGraph, and then the Neo4j, um, or actually it's, a, it's not the official Neo4j Python driver, but is written by a gentleman named Nigel Small, who actually also works at Neo. And it is so incredibly beautifully documented and is so wonderfully functional that um, I encourage you, if you guys play with it, shoot Nigel a thank you note. Um, this is his baby, um, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, so to get started, um, actually I have the, my Jupyter Notebook open. Um, but so this is, I'll make it bigger. Bigger is better. Um, so we're going to go through, and um, actually after this talk, I'll, I'll send you guys the, the, this, this notebook. Um, and so one, we're just ensuring, hey, you make sure that um, I actually have PyT Neo installed. Um, I do. And so if we were to essentially, more here is to show the um, basic format of how you, you'd pass Cypher into um, the, the PyT Neo driver. And so we're simply saying, you know, que query equals, and then a string that contains a Cypher query. And then um, just show me these, this result. And so for example, um, we're simply saying, you know, find me groups that, that have a topic that contains Python. Um, and I mean, 
Pytest like that there are more Python groups there, right? And I'm 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 hoping that this was simply just uh, my 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 API crawl just didn't didn't do as much as I hoped it did. So right there, there are lots of meetup groups here. Yes, yes, no, quiet. All right. And so um, we're actually going to calculate topic similarity. And so um, you know, obviously we understand how to execute ci queries in Cipher now, at least at a high level. Um, so what we're going to do is one, you know, make sure we have iGraph installed. Um, and so what we're going to do is um, we're going to find all pairs of topics and then work a number of common groups there. And then we'll use that as, as a weight in our, in our similarity calculations. It's kind of what we did originally, where we said group one, group two, count how many are similar. And so we see that um, the, the topic of, um, sorry, if we're going to do topic, group topic, um, the topic of social networking, co-appears with a, the topic of social, you know, 175 times in our data set. Um, the topic of social co-appears with, with new in town 173 times. Um, and so what we want to do is, is kind of wrap that output in a graph and, and then pass that to, to iGraph. So we've instantiated iGraph. Um, and let's actually um, do, do some cluster detection. Um, so it's actually reasonably large data sets. This may take a second. Um, so we've actually identified 81 clusters in our in our in our um, in our data set. And actually, how many how many different topics do we have? Let's find out for curiosity's sake. Um, spelling's helpful. So out of the 2,709 topics we have, uh, we've actually were able to to chunk them down into about 81. Um, natural groups. And so what we'd actually like to do is take, so we've identified the, these 81 clicks, and um, actually, so a little bit about the, the algorithm, algorithm we used. Um, it's called walk trap. And essentially, the, the, the hope is for, you know, you start with each um, topic will start as its own individual group. And what we're simply going to do is, is grab the, the adjacent relationships and essentially try and minimize the amount of variance or minimize the amount of outgoing relationships from that from that group. And so essentially it'll add, say, oh, okay, you know, oh, we, we added more, um, more outgoing relationships, let's bring it back one. And um, so essentially it allows you to identify natural chunks of, of, of nodes within your data set. And so, <clears throat> we're gonna write a Cypher query that takes the results of our community detection algorithm and write the results back to Neo4j. So we're using um, Python and iGraph to enrich our data set to do some interesting um, community detection and then saying, okay, to make that operational, um, let's actually pass that back into our database. Oh, got to do things in order. Um, so uh, first we actually need to define these groups. Um, so for example, in, in group zero, we have the topics of dating over 35, also in group zero is dating advice. Also in group zero is social networking. Um, and then we want to pass these um, back to Neo. And so we want to take a quick look at that. We actually see that we, we've created um, a new relationship here where we've created a new cluster node and then said, okay, grab all the topics that we've, we've determined are within that, that cluster and tie those back to this new topic node and that'll give us a new handle for making some interesting recommendations. So what does that look like? Um, let's match cluster. Return P. So for example, we wanted to see what does this new cluster we have look like? Um, this is kind of cluster zero we're talking about that contains you know, singles over 50, dating over 35. Um, and so as a, as a side note about the visualization tool here in the browser, um, <clears throat> it typically only renders right around the 100 to, to 500 nodes, and that's kind of the comfortable limit of what you know, we as, as users can understand nicely. Um, if you're looking to do more you know, global visualization, um, there's some, some better JavaScript libraries for that. Um, but for actually inspecting our data, I think this is absolutely excellent. 
Um, so we would double click on, on the group uh, and say, okay, expand me, show me a little bit more of, uh, of what's actually attached to that. And we can zoom out a bit and say, okay, group zero is actually a pretty, pretty densely connected um, group. And if we would actually click on one of these, um, these topic nodes, you actually, what are the actual groups associated with it? Oof. Aggressive visualization. So for example, the, the speed networking topic has um, the Asian American Chicago network um, tied to it, as does the um, networking insider edge style Chicago uh, meetup group as well. So back to our, our handy dandy browser guide. Um, oh, that's exactly what we just did. Um, and so if we were to, to look at um, topic similarity, and I apologize that for some reason I didn't end up with a lot of, of Python groups. Um, I ended up simply with just, you know, Python in, in cluster two. And unfortunately, there weren't, you know, that we saw earlier, there's only one group tied to that Python node. Um, but if we were to inspect, you know, what are, what are the groups that are similar to, or that have been, been grouped, or the topics that have been grouped with Python, um, we end up with, you know, the topic of co-founder, women's networking, um, startup businesses, retirement planning. I don't know if that, that's a little bit of quant stuff. Um, but next, uh, we hope to expand a little more now that we have um, kind of this basic content filtering of where we say, um, this group shares a lot of, share of topics with this other group, so we know that they're similar. We've now actually chunked those, those, those topics together and said, well, these topics are actually all very similar to one another. Um, let's expand a little bit more on our recommendation engine. And so we're gonna, one, we're gonna, we're gonna actually do some individualization here and say, okay, let's exclude the groups that I'm a member of. Um, it's great to, to leverage the things I'm already doing in a recommendation engine, but obviously um, we would like to, to say the anti banner of, you know, don't recommend me things I already own or the, the, the groups I'm already a member of. Actually, zoom back out. And so, um, let's take a quick look at, at kind of this membership data set. Um, so, for example, we have uh, somebody just an array here on Adam Kralik of all the topics that he, he's, he's affiliated with and, and the group he's, he's tied to. Um, and so, what we're going to do is simply just do that same load CSV exercise and um, tie both the topics that um, Adam has said, that, hey, I'm interested in whatever 781 is. I'm deeply in love with 15121. It's super interesting to me. Um, as well as the, the groups that he's joined. Um, for example, we have a row here saying that he has joined um, group, you know, group ID, you know, 1017702. Um, and then actually the timestamp at which he joined that group at. And we can actually look at um, a little more to say the groups I'm joining today may be more relevant to the recommendations of the groups I joined four years ago and I just haven't cleared out my, my meetup, uh, my meetup you know, subscription feed. So it's actually one, create a uniqueness constraint here um, where we don't want members to be, be replicated. We're hoping that we are all unique individuals, unique preferences. And so, um, a quick topic I want to introduce in terms of, of interacting with Neo4j's load CSV tool. Um, is, is periodic commit. So Cypher will keep all transactions, um, all transaction state in memory um, while running a query, which nine times out of 10 is totally fine. But when we're doing really, really large imports, and the next one we're about to do is, is a couple hundred thousand members. Um, we're going to use something called um, a periodic commit. And the reason why we do that is to avoid an, an out of memory exception. And so if we use the, the, the key phrase of you know, using periodic commit, um, load CSV, we're just going to default to um, thousand row chunks. Um, though we can actually pass in a, a, a given value. And just you know, anecdotally, most of the time between um, 5,000 to 10,000 is kind of the the happy medium for, for performance there. 
And the next thing I want to talk about is, is the with clause. And if, if you notice so far, uh, we've just been doing fairly isolated queries of you know, do x, do y. Um, what the with, with clause will allow us to do is um, to build query parts together and, and chain them together to say, um, do this interesting traversal, find you know, whatever's hanging off the end of this, this, this pattern, grab whatever's hanging off that and do these other things with it, um, and allows you to, to really extend and write a fairly sophisticated graph traversal um, in a hopefully reasonably easy fashion. <clears throat> it can be used to limit the number of entries that are passed into other match clauses. Um, for example, if I, you know, I said, hey, you know, grab me an arbitrary 100 members out of, out of the, the meetup data set, and I'd only like to operate on those, those 100 users, we'd use a with clause to say, you know, match me some users, limit that to 100. Um, we can filter on aggregate values. Um, and we can separate reading from updating in the graph for, for efficiency's sake. Um, though now that we have a um, cost-based execution planner, um, that is not as imperative, but it's still you know, good practice. Um, any questions so far? No? Okay. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and load this data in. And so to inspect this, this query a little more, we're saying using periodic commit 10,000 as we discussed a little earlier. Same call, load CSV with headers. You know, this, the CSV has, has, has headers that we're going to be using to, to choose um, what values to grab. We're providing it a location. Um, and then we're saying with distinct row ID as ID, um, grab the, um, the name property under the row and just alias that as name. And then what we're going to do is simply merge. Um, th yet again, this is a, a arbitrary identifier. This could be M. We you know, create a new member that way. Uh, merge some member, meaning create a node that is, is, that is labeled member with a property called um, ID, which we've grabbed from that ID header within our CSV. Oh, and I did that twice. Cancel. Whoops. Um, and so what we'd like to do is, is connect members. And by the way, actually, if we were to go back and try that again, because we added that uniqueness constraint, um, nothing will happen. Because it'll just say, oh, you know, um, we've already created that. So, you know, sorry, good luck. Um, we've, we've, we've essentially, we've enforced that we can't double create a, a, a member. So we'll see, you know, no changes, no rows. Um, and so now uh, what we're going to do is, is connect these, these members. And so we're going to say, you know, one, read back through that this member CSV. And if you remember earlier, we had that, that group ID um, header. And so we say, match me the member that we just created, match me the, gro the group um, that we've already also created, but we're just grabbing that ID out of that, that header column. And we're saying merge, meaning ensure that this pattern exists within our database, that this member um, now has a new relationship called member of with a direction to the, this group that we just found. And then uh, on create set, um, meaning so if you are making this new relationship, go ahead and add this additional property. And so we're saying is create a new property called joined on that relationship. And we're going to do grab it from the, um, the value from that, that joined header within our CSV. And so a thing to note here is we're doing a bit of a string operation. Because so Neo4j's load CSV tool will interpret everything as a string. And simply what we'll have to do is, is uh, cajole it in some fashion to say, oh, you know, to int, to float, et cetera. Actually, let's, let's take a look at our, our current data set. So as we're sewing all these things together, um, lots of members, lots of groups. Um, let's see if we, we've gotten anything done yet. OK. So um, what we're doing is so Scott, the Scott the drummer um, is a member of the, the um, Get Off the Couch group, as is Robert Harris and Rick Helm and Patty, et cetera. And so we can start to say, oh, you know, if lots of these users are also members of the same groups, maybe they're already friends, and then we could actually use that to um, create, you know, some sort of synthetic friendship relationship or nose relationship. Um, or if they're, they're co-members of, of a lot of the same groups, we then look at the delta and say, oh, um, you know, Scott and Rick are both members of, you know, 25 of the same groups. But Scott's a member of two others that Rick isn't. Maybe we should recommend those to him. 
it's still loading. And so let's also add some additional indexes where, because we're going to be wanting to grab onto members based on their names. And so I assume since you guys all know lots about meetups that you may be a part of some of these groups. Um, so you can go and try and find yourself within these groups. Um, does anyone want to give me their name and we'll try it and do it? No? No one. All right, fine. I planned for this. Um, so uh, some of you guys may know Max DeMarzi is a Neo4j Neo engineer that uh, up until recently lived in Chicago. Um, so I will be abusing him for the rest of this demo. Um, and so here's Max. So we're saying you match me some member um, where they have a name that is a string called Max DeMarzi. Um, so here's Max. Hi, Max. Um, and so we may want to say, okay, what are, what are the relationship or what are the groups that, that uh, Max is a member of? Return M. Let's go to that. Give it an identifier. So it seems like Max not is no longer you know incredibly active in the in the Chicago Meetup community, and so he's only a member of the Hacker News Chicago group and the Bootstrappers Breakfast. Um, and so a thing to note here is that there are two ways to um, to identify properties on a given node for for the filtering steps. Um, so you can do um, you know, match some member with um, curly brace and the properties that we wanted to operate on or to, to filter on. Um, and so, I mean, these would have the exact same output as, as before. Um, or we can simply do it, you know, in a where predicate here and say, you know, where m dot name, et cetera. You know. And so, uh, as we saw earlier from, from our last query, uh, Max is lame. He's only a member of two groups. Um, and so, let's actually look a little deeper into it and say, well, what are the groups that are, or what are the topics that those groups are, are affiliated with to start, you know, kind of building this, this recommendation query slowly. Um, so, we're saying, you know, match me, um, Max, the, and the groups he's a member of. And then of those groups, grab the topics that those groups are, are affiliated with. And so now we see that um, Hacker News Chicago is tied to you know, Ruby and hacking and Django. Um, and Bootstrapper's Breakfast is tied to um, startup businesses and, and all this, this um, entrepreneurship, peer-to-peer -peer advisory, et cetera. And so then you know, we're going to take another step out and say, OK, we grab all the groups that, that Max is a member of all the topics that those um, groups are affiliated with, and actually look at the number of, of clusters that those, those groups are tied to. And um, I'd be willing to guess that they're, they're probably all tied to the same, same clusters. Um, and so if you notice here, we've just simply just thrown a comma in here to um, create a, a more complex pattern. And so we're just still referring to these same identifiers. So this group is the same group here. Um, so we're saying, you know, member of group, group has topic, topic has cluster. Um, and then count the number of, of clusters that these, these groups are tied to. Um, so yeah, his, his topics are tied to cluster number two 25 times, and then cluster zero once. Um, actually, let's, let's try some other people. Um, match. Number um, turn m dot name uh, skip arbitrary number 143 return one. Let's grab two random people out of our data set and see what they're tied to. Um, so we have uh, you know Anita Johnson. Um, so let's see what groups she's tied to or what topics she's tied to. Oh, she's really interested in cluster zero, which if you guys remember earlier was um, the it, kind of the, the dating and social networking cluster. And then uh, Arika T. Anderson. Um, let's see what she's interested in. Just for curiosity. Ooh, she's a super active member. That's awesome. We're going to use her for the rest of this demo. Um, <laughs> 
Cool. Uh, I'm going to try and find her and send her thank you. Um, so she's tied to many different clusters. She's tied to tons of groups, it seems like. Um, so she's tied to cluster zero 385 times. She's pr probably pretty social. Um, if you remember, cluster two was the one that was tied to a lot of the, the developer and engineering groups, um, and as well as, as a good deal of others. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Rika. And so let's, let's go further down this rabbit hole and actually start doing some, some sorting and filtering. Um, so let's actually grab these, these topics and actually look at, look at them a little more, deep, more deeply. Oh, that's literally the last thing we just did. Come on. <laughs> um, and so let's just exclude the groups that um, uh, Arika is a member of. Um, and so we want to find groups that are similar to, to the Outdoorsy Adventure Club. Um, so I can't remember the, the name of it. We're going to do this. Um, and group dot name uh, starts with outdoor. It was outdoorsy, right? So groups that are similar to this outdoorsy group that um, share some topics with the things that Arika is interested in. Um, so we may want to recommend her to, to join the Get Out and Do It Adventure and Social Meetup group. And so where you might be using this, this recommendation query would be if she's you know, traversed to the, the um, outdoorsy entrepreneurship page and we want to look at other things that might be relevant to both this you know, expressed intent here by navigating to the page, but as well as the other things we know about her. And so this is kind of the, the, the shape of, of the, the recommendation we're starting to look at. Of, so um, by, by navigating to a topic, I've expressed interest in it. Um, and, or I may have even clicked on the page and said, oh yeah, interesting. Um, and so I'm also the member of a group and we're looking for these, these shared topics as well as these, these, um, these, these shared clusters. And so we're, we're going to do this, this find my similar groups again. So we'll grab Eureka. Um, and so to, to kind of dissect this you know, messy long traversal, we're simply saying um, start at, a, at that, that index node, right? Remember, as we talked about, find where we're going to be starting in our graph, um, grab you know, this member by, by her name, grab the, the groups she's a member of, grab the topics that those groups are affiliated with, and then grab the other groups that share that topic. Um, and where she's not already a member of that, that other group that we're recommending. Um, and then essentially order these by um, the number of topics in common, most similar to her current portfolio of, of, of groups. And so based on all the things she's expressed some sort of interest in by joining membership groups, um, we would recommend to her, hey, Dan, go join the Do What You Love Chicago Singles Meetup group. Um, Live, laugh, love, travel. It's great things for her to do. Send her an email later, but hey, we figured out what you want. Um, and so, uh, actually, we, we've actually here done this part where we actually grab someone who is, is tied to lots of, of different meetup groups and seen how they change. Um, for example, um, if we were to do this with, with Max, I imagine these would be much less interesting recommendations. Oh, actually, not bad. So we, you know, we end up with Product Hunt Chicago, Chicago Freelancers Meetup, um, things that kind of seem to be in his cachet of interest. Cool. And so now let, let's do some, some event recommendations. Um, kind of, if you guys remember from the, the slides earlier, where we were looking at um, kind of these two here, where we're looking at one, kind of the, these email pings to say, hey, um, you might be interested in going to this event. You know, we know you don't have anything on your calendar, and you know it's is when your your time frame of typical attendance, or B, looking at just simply as I'm browsing through the the meetup.com calendar, and they say, oh, these are the events at 6:30, 7 o'clock, and so forth that you might be interested in. So we're actually going to want to grab the events that these these groups are hosting. Um, so what we're doing is we have okay, one. Um, when is the event? Um, we actually have a little little status uh, property here, just to say, look, what are the, the previous events that they've had, or is this an upcoming event? Um, 
and then also what group are they tied to. And so we're going to go ahead and load these in. Um, you guys should be, be pros at this now where we're um, asserting one, you know, the, the event ID is unique. Two, we're going to create an index on event time because we're going to be searching on it quite a bit. So let's go ahead and import those. Um, we're going to go ahead and use that same periodic commit that we talked about earlier. Um, we're grabbing a whole different CSV now called the event CSV. Um, we're going to go ahead and merge these events to ensure that these events exist um, based on these IDs. And if we, if we figure out that we haven't already created this node, when we do, um, grab all of these other values from, from the row that in, our, in our CSV. And so let's actually take a quick look at that. Um, so to ensure that things are imported correctly, again, we, we notice we end up with just islands of nodes. We double click, nothing expands. Um, and the reason why we do this is, is kind of as a general best practice. Um, it allows you to at a much higher fidelity if you know, a meteor hits your data center and during an import. Um, Neo4j is load CSV is a transactional import um, such that um, if something were to explode, um, it would say, oh, yeah, we're committed to this point. You know, there are no um, partial commits. This is where we're at. And if you're doing it based on this, um, this merge command, you essentially can just trickle down and say, oh, okay, that, that's where the data center exploded. Um, or if, if you're, you're doing the um, ensure that a relationship exists, again, um, it's much, much easier to figure out, oh, okay, this is the intermediate step that, that we were at. And so let's go ahead and tie those all together. And so to, to take another look at this, um, we're going to grab you know, the distinct group IDs. Um, we're going to grab the, the row IDs. Um, the, the, these are the IDs of the groups that were, were or the events that we're, we're looking at. Um, based on the group ID and the event ID, find those things that already exist within our database. Um, and with those two groups, go ahead and ensure that there's a relationship between the group and the, and the, group and the event they're hosting. And we'll just call it hosted event. Um, so just to generically look at it, oh, there's no Neo4j here. Um, outdoors. Um, so he's, here are the events hosted by the, the outdoorsy group. Um, they hosted um, yoga for your work day. Um, they actually, that's kind of their thing, is, is hosting yoga for your work day. Um, some sort of summer rooftop event. And so um, what we're actually going to do, so if we're looking at simply the, the groups we're already uh, affiliated with, and so if we wanted to see for um, Erika, um, what are the, the future events that, that may be, be relevant for her to attend, kind of these, these basic recommendations of saying, hey, these are the things you've already expressed interest in. Um, so what we're doing here is saying, OK, grab her, grab her groups, and um, <clears throat> grab the events that those groups are hosting, where the time at which the event occurs is you know, greater than this moment right now. Um, and simply just return me the group names, the name of the, the event, and then um, essentially what we're doing here is something a little bit of math to figure out um, how many days out that is. Is it zero? Is it today? Is it one, two, three, x days out? Um, and order by the, the, the events that are happening today, and then work out from there. Um, so things that are happening tomorrow for oh, tomorrow at the time we scrape this, um, there is you know there must be this place with Joe McMahon, McMahon, um, free beer and comedy, et cetera. And so this is be kind of our, our initial recommendation to her as she hit her, her meetup.com page, <clears throat> um, where we'd say, hey, you know, Free Chicago Events is, ho is having these two two events right now. You've already directly expressed interest by joining these groups, but we're we're going to be a little slyer than that. We'll, we'll add a little more. Um, <clears throat> so let's actually look at future events based on, on the topics she's expressed interest in. Um, so what we're saying here is you know, go ahead and grab uh, Arika again. Um, grab these future events that we've just, just grabbed. Um, and so what we're simply doing is um, ensure that these events are, are part of the groups that she's joined. On similar to that exist keyword is we're, we're matching that pattern. Um, and then we're seeing an optional match um, that it, um, these things that she has expressed interest in 
um, and that these events share those topics, or that these groups share those topics that host these events. Um, and so hopefully at this point you guys are starting to see that um, recommendations are inherently very, very graphy. We're looking at several steps out to make a, a simple, you know, go to this event recommendation. And so um, we're going to say, you know, with these things we've identified, these topics that we, we've identified, um, grab these, these um, future events, um, and then go ahead and return them um, ordered by which events are happening uh, soonest. Ooh, Arika's got a lot of events. My poor laptop. Sorry. Um, so let's try that again. Um, so let's grab Max because he has significantly fewer events. Hmm. I may have broken something. Oh, actually, there we go. Um, so for Rico, we have um, kind of future events based on um, the common topics that exist within our network. Um, it's interesting that they primarily share one, one common topic. Um, and so these are groups that she's not already associated with, but events that are very similar um, to those that she um, has already expressed, or it, very similar to the groups in which she's expressed interest in going to. Um, so we might recommend these and saying, okay, here, here are the events within your catalog of groups, um, but if you're wanting to branch out, find some new events to go to, these are the things that may be relevant to you. And so um, to, I guess, kind of put into your court, um, Maybe try and go ahead and show, if you guys are coding along, the, the events that are happening in the next seven days. Um, and then also show events that are happening for the topics in, in my top cluster. And so, um, actually, here, let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and answer those together. Um, So if we extend the um, we extend the query we just ran, um, we can actually say okay, where um, we're gonna go ahead and grab. We're gonna be referring to group. Days. Oops. Cool. And so the, the events happening in the next seven days for her um, are simply these. Um, and so simply all we did was take um, the um, number of days outgoing, uh, we, we've moved that up into with statement, aliased it as, as, a, as days, and simply just did some, so, uh, a little bit of a, a um, less than and said, okay, well, four days is less than seven, um, and so we returned those events. And then we continue to order them by the, the things that are happening mo more recently. And so this is kind of a, the Mac Daddy query. This, this is what we would actually end up trying to deploy. Um, and so um, I'll try and walk, walk through this reasonably slowly. But so the goal is um, to create an aggregate recommendation where we're saying, here are the events that are coming up in, 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 your, um, in your groups. And these are also, we're going we're gonna to insert within the, those results 
um, events that are in groups that are similar to those that you've already joined. Um, but we'd actually like to, to weight those um, based on if you've already said, I, I'm a part of this group, I like going to their events, we'll give that a higher um, weight. And if, if not, we'll just kind of give it a, a generic or a zero. Um, and so the query we just executed where we're saying, you know, match me, um, you know, a given member, let's, get, let's grab max again. Um, match some event, we're calling it future event, um, where it's happening um, soon, uh, where essentially it's happening beyond today. Um, we're going to then say ensure that one, if you've noticed, we're actually grouping together these, these three recommendation queries we've done earlier. We're ensuring that um, uh, one, I'm a member of these current groups for the, the my group um, events we're grabbing, and then we're optionally matching. Um, events that they may be hosting. And then we're going to say, OK, for those, let's, let's do common topics. We use this for our, our similarity. And then we'll say, OK, well, let's also grab um, those events um, that are hosted by groups that I'm not necessarily part of. And then if it's part of my group, we're going to go ahead and give it a, a plus 5. And if not, we'll just give it a 0. And so then we're, we're going to go ahead and, and return um, our, our aggregate query. Oh, Max, there's no future events for him. Let's try Rika. Um, what's her name? All right, so let's see what's coming up for her that we can recommend. Oh, because this is week old data. Oh, the demo gods dislike me. Um, Sorry, the browser really hates being zoomed in. And let's say going forward. So I think that the real lesson here is I should have done this on live data. Oh, it's still. Well, guys, on that note, apparently, I'm going to throw in the towel. Um, so this would be the structure of how we would do this. Um, but I guess the, the, the lesson learned, especially for me here, is using week old data and then using lots of timestamps, it's not good. Um, so just kind of walk through it again. Um, we're simply trying to look for events um, that are either within um, Arika's given groups that are coming up within, within a number of days. And B, we're also looking at groups that share topics with those who's already expressed interest in and grabbing the events that those are hosting in the next few days. And then essentially upweighting and downweighting those to say, well, if you, you've directly expressed interest, push those at the top of the results set. And if you haven't, um, leave those as a, as a neutral score. Um, cool. So I guess any questions? Um, and I'm, I'm going to make this work. And please find me in the hallway, and I'll, I'll show you guys. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Oh. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so to really kind of, it will come down to uh, more network density versus the actual size of the data set. I'm sorry, so the question was, um, in terms of scaling things like collaborative filtering with Neo4j, um, where do you start to, to bump into to, to, you know, scaling limits? And so, so the, the, the answer is that um, it's less about the, the aggregate size of the data set. Um, so what, what Neo4j will do is, is once it's grabbed a, a, a node or a node ID, um, it'll be doing pointer arithmetic or pointer chasing between nodes. And so um, it's more looking at network density to say, if we have each node is, is, you know, has 100 million relationships, um, that's going to hurt. You know, just, it's going to crush any computer. But if you're still looking at you know, an average density of you know, a couple thousand, a couple million, um, you're going to see pretty reasonable response times um, without regard to aggregate data set size. Yeah. Problem.